Welcome to the Faith Christian Fellowship of Montego Bay's podcast. We are reaching for His glory through building and teaching. I hope you are encouraged and edified by this message. Today, I will be sharing with you about the battlefield in spiritual warfare. There are three battlefields in spiritual warfare the mind, the church, and the heavenlies. And it seemed logical that we would start with the mind. And that's what I've been preparing to start on until I got some different directions from headquarters. So we are going to start with the heavenlies today. We're going to start about uh, with talking about the heavenness. And I love what Darlene Sheck says, that worship gives you a handle. It gives you a handle to take control of the heavenness. Let me, first of all, establish that the heavenless is different from the high heaven. The high heaven, is uh, speaks to the seat of authority of the kingdom of heaven. That's where the eternal Godhead is headquartered. The heavenless speaks to the airspace, the, the general environment. So the heavenless is heavily linked to the sense realm. The sense realm heavily impacts the heavenless. So we know that Satan is a master of the sense realm and he will try to impose on you. So sometimes you might just feel depressed without any good reason as the enemy tries to close in on you through the heaven. The sense realm is impacted or impacts the heavenlies a lot, along with, of course, the demonic activities that are taking place. And of course, the spirit of God works through every situation. The angels are still working on your behalf in the heavenlies also. But let us start out with Ephesians chapter 6 here, reading uh, verse number 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And by the way, I must tell you that we're not going to be able to get through all of them today. The more I got into the information, the more I realized that it's just impossible. And uh, it's not right to do that injustice to you or to the information. So we hopefully can do it in two weeks. Not that we would finish it, but at least we would get enough information. For we are not wrestling or fighting against flesh and blood enemies. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in the dark world and against spirits in the heavenly places. Some of you might be more used to the King James version that says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world or this age. So we all understand that we are wrestling. All of us are fighting. We are in a fight. There's no two ways about that. And we have to fight if we intend to win. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But I want to point out to you that it is not just when you feel that someone in your family has a demonic attack or or something is not happening 
right in your immediate space. It is not just only that time or those times that we are wrestling against principalities and powers. It's not only that time that we are in a fight, we're in a constant fight. So I want you to understand that when you are driving down the road, you're wrestling, you're fighting against principalities and powers. When you are walking down the street, you are wrestling against principalities and power. When you're on vacation, you're still wrestling against principalities and power. The fight continues, not because it is not intense in your life at the particular time, not because your family is not experiencing certain levels of attack, mean that you are not in a fight. When you are at home, even when everybody's laughing, we are still wrestling against principalities and powers. In every waking moment of your life, the fight is on. We are wrestling against principalities and powers. And you cannot properly detect and understand what is happening in the heavenlies with your natural mind. So it's not the intelligence of this world that will enable you to detect what is happening in the heavenlies. Sometimes it is so pronounced that, of course, you can know something is off, but it is this, the Holy Spirit that will enable you to detect what is happening in the realm of the spirit and enable you to successfully fight against it. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the Bible says that the natural man does not understand the things of the spirit. Your foolishness to him is, the Bible says, to your natural mind, because those things are spiritually discerned. So if you are not walking in the spirit, if you are not led by the Holy Spirit, then you can't really even relate to what is really happening. And that is why the Bible teaches us in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 that we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith means you walk by trust in God and not by sight. Sight there speaks to the sense realm. It's not just talking about just your eyesight. It's talking about the sense realm. So we walk by faith, not by sight. For the most part, believers just don't do enough to take control of the heavenlies. If the, the attack is not about to take us out for the most part. We don't do enough to take care of the heavenlies. And we don't respond to the mechanism. We don't respond to the things that are put in place, the tools that we have to take control of the uh, heavenlies. We, we just don't use them as effective as we ought. So you know how prayer meetings are attended. That's one of the things that takes control of the sensory. And so we have to understand that the, there's an enemy, there's an enemy that is always active. So if you don't get active, there's only going to be one result. You'll be overcome by the spirits that you should be overcoming. So we have to understand that the fight is daily, it is constant, it is every waking moment, the wrestling is on, and we can't take anything for granted just because we're not seeing manifestations that certain, thing, certain things are happening. If you want the devil to put real pressure on you, allow him to take over the, the, end, the heavenless. Allow him to take over the environment of your home. And that can almost run you crazy. You see, when you leave work under pressure and can't go home to a peaceful environment, 
a space that is going to um, impart energy and life into you, you put yourself under all kinds of pressure. So you have to understand that we are in a fight and it's constant. The reality is that spirits do influence operations on earth and the manifestations that you see in the natural are results of things that are happening in the spirit. But, but sometimes we are, people are so disconnected from what happens in the spirit and spiritual operation that we can only see the manifestations in the natural. And don't remember, don't realize that it started somewhere. That is actually the manifestation in the natural is a result of what has been happening in the realm of the spirit. So if you realize that all of a sudden, everyone around you in your environment and is going to the hospital for unknown sickness over the last three months, it's something that is happening in the realm of the spirit. And you probably would be the one to deal with it because you are the light. The results in the, uh, the, the natural, the manifestations in the natural are indication of things that are happening in the realm of the spirit. And we have to be very con uh, uh, understanding of that and ensure that the enemy don't get the better of us. So the battle to control the airspace, the, the, the heavenlies, is certainly constant and a fight that won't be over in this life. A fight that will continue and you are in it for as long as you are in this earth. So in every country, in every town, in every city, in every community, there are evil spirits assigned to influence operations. And they work. Many results that you uh, see, as I said, they are not ordinary. They are manifestations of the prince and the power of the air that is working behind the scene, producing those manifestations. Now, how do we engage the heavenness? Because remember, you know, that's an unseen realm. How do we effect engage the heavenless. As I said before, one is through prayer, constant prayer. That is very important, constant prayer. We're not talking about when you have time. It has to be constant. You have to make time. And it is always better to have a particular time when you meet with God in prayer, not just when you have time tomorrow, when you have time today. But if you want to see awesome manifestation, you make sure you meet in with God five o'clock every morning, uh, 10 o'clock every day. If you set that out, you'd be amazed at the kind of things that are happening or start happening in your life when you schedule that time and meet, meet with God and the heavenly, the host of heaven, rather, schedule that time to meet with you to carry out assignments. That makes things just special. So prayer, praise and worship, which is another form of prayer really, that is one of the biggest tool, biggest weapon as it relates to taking control of the heavens. And we will talk about that a little bit more later on. But also speaking the word, it is important. People ask, what different does it make what I say? It makes all the difference in the world. That can determine which spirit you're telling to come and which spirit you're telling to go. And let me say that, you know, sometimes as believers, we get caught between two realities. And somebody will say, am I supposed to say my head is not hurting me when it is hurting? I have to be real. We're not saying to say your head is not hurting you when it's hurting. I'm just saying that sometimes you get caught between two realities and you have to decide which of those realities you're going to go with. 
So yes, it's a reality that your head is hurting, but it is also a reality and more of a reality that by his stripes you were healed. You are healed. So which one of those realities are you going to go with? Which one are you going to put out there in the heavens? By his stripes I am healed. Or my head is killing me. It's about what you put out there in the heavens. It's going to produce certain results. Also, declarations are important in taking control of the heavens. It is important to, to make declarations all the time over the church, over your community, over your home. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord to declare things over your children. These children shall serve the Lord for the rest of their life, even when you see that spliff in their mouth. Father, I thank you that this boy will serve the Lord and preach the gospel. You make the declaration and take control of the heavens. We walk by faith, not by sight. I learned some time ago of a, a missile that the Americans use in war. No doubt there are other countries that use it, but I learned it through the United States of America. There's a mi missile called the Patriot missile. And it is a very interesting uh, missile. What it does is whenever destructive missiles are fired to maybe destroy a particular country or, or a space, what they do is, in an effort to intercept those destructive missiles, they fire the Patriot missile. The Patriot missile. And what the Patriot missile does is go up there in the air, pull close to the destructive missiles, like the Scud missiles and the smart bombs and all of that, and diffuses that thing in the air before it lands on Earth. So whenever that destructive missile falls on Earth, or what is supposed to be a destructive missile, whenever it falls anywhere on the Earth, it's just a shell because it um, was diffused from in the air. I am saying to you that our praise, our prayer, our declaration, speak in the word is like patriot missile and before i go on let me say something very important about the patriot missile that really blessed me when i was studying it as, as the lord just started to download in my spirit the patriot missile is known to be a guided missile and that is very very crucial because sometimes we as believers fire some things some missiles but they're not guided i want you to hear me out for a moment have you ever been in a prayer meeting or even in a praise and worship uh session or even sitting under the ministry of the word and you are experienced enough that after the end of that session you feel that it was not guided. Yes, some good things were said here and there, but it was all over the place. So you come out of it feeling unaccomplished. Yes, the song was good. Yes, that word was good, but you never felt like it, it hit a target because it wasn't guided. Maybe the order or some other reason caused that. So. The Patriot missile is a guided missile and it goes and diffuse, diffuses what the enemy intended to create destruction. Our worship, the ministry of the word, the, the declarations, the prayer meetings ought to be guided by the Holy Spirit and by the word of God so that when you release such it goes into the heavenless and detect what the enemy has released against you and your family and diffuses that thing before it gets to your house before it gets to your community 
before it gets to your space. Diffuses it so that when it comes to the, the ground, it is shell and has no impact. But you have to intercept that thing in the heavenless. If you wait until it reaches your house, then maybe, maybe half a dozen people could be dead in your house or injured. Because remember that in every war, there are casualties. So whatever we do in the kingdom of God ought to be guided by the Holy Spirit and by the word of God. Now you see the importance of being led by the Holy Spirit. And so ministry is so important. It's not something that you just wake up in the morning and slap up something to present because you have to present in church or in a seminar or, or something. No, we need guided missiles to intercept the heavenlies. Otherwise, you do what you're doing, but you know, if you're not careful, even the demons participate. This is one of the big reasons why I love to pray in tongues, because the word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14, that if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me, the Amplified Bible says, pray. So when I pray with an, an unknown tongue, it is my spirit guided by the Holy Spirit that is praying. So even though I don't know what is happening with my aunt in New York or my mom and my relatives in St. Thomas that is far from me or my friends in Canada and the United States, when I pray and the Holy Spirit guides that prayer, it goes all the way to New York or Africa for whoever I'm praying and intercept what the enemy intended for evil. When it is released, as I said, by the Holy Spirit, it goes into the air like a magnet and intercept what the enemy intended for your life. And by the time it reaches your space, it is gone or in terms of the effect. Now, there's a story in, I think it's Second Chronicles chapter 20, the first or second Chronicles chapter 20, where three armies came up against Jehoshaphat and uh, the children of God. And I've, I've preached on that many times. And I've heard many people preach on it. So very good testimony of the manifestations of God. But let me point out something in that story. Three armies came up against Jehoshaphat and the children of God. The Ammonites, the Moabites, and the army from Mount Seir. Each of those army was powerful. I mean, Israel in their own strength would have problems fighting against any one of those army by itself. Much more, all three teamed up and came against the people of God. When Jehoshaphat realized what was happening, the Bible says that he called out everyone to do a day of fast and prayer. And I love that. When you read the story, when you have time, read it. It says he called out the, the young, the children and the women. Remember now that in Israel, in those days, the, the fighting force was just the men. The men went to war. So when it talks about the people went to war uh, or go to war, it would be the fighting force, the men. But Joseph had called out before the war, called out the women and the children, the little ones, the Bible says, to fast. There are those occasions when we need to summon everybody. Oh yeah, people are grown and all of that, but you have to tell them that today we are fasting in this house. Some things are happening. Today, we're fasting in this church. Today, we are fasting in this community because we want some results that is going to require some. And God gave Joseph some instructions. He said, listen, I want on this occasion, I want you to send the praises first. I want to show you the strategy that was in it. God knew what he was doing. You know, even though we take hundreds of years to see, God always knows what he's doing. Remember that all knowledge is derived from him. He's all-knowing, not just meaning that he knows everything that you have ever done, 
or knows everything that is happening today, but he knows everything that will ever happen. So God instructed him, a Josephus, send the praises first. Did not, not see any battle like this. It didn't sound logical. Didn't sound like something that makes sense. But what God was doing was ensuring that they take control of the heavenlies. That battlefield of the heavenlies needed to be controlled for Joseph and his people to win the war. So by sending the praises first, what the praise was doing was going into the heavenlies and intercepting the activities of the kingdom of darkness so that the people of God could get the result. It wasn't just for show or fashion. It was a strategy. It was taking control of a very important battlefield that needed to be conquered in order for that war or that battle to be won. What an awesome God we serve. So the praises win first and God moved by his spirit in a miraculous way. Another story that we may have looked at many times and sang about it and talk about it was that story when Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho with Israel. We talk about a guided missile here. On, on the last day, they walked around a few times and at the end, God instructed them to give a shot. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you that that shout was not any ordinary shout. It wasn't just noise shout. It was a shout guided by the spirit of God right into the heavenlies to intercept the spirits of darkness that was there, the activities of the kingdom of darkness. So when they lifted up their voices and in one go gave a shout, whew, that thing rocked the heavenlies in such a way that I mean it shocked every force of darkness that was in the space and the walls came down. It wasn't just an empty shout. It wasn't just let us shout. That was a shout guided by the Holy Spirit. And in one moment, it shut down every demonic forces in that space so that victory could be manifested. Let me give you, a, let me give you an example of that. How many of you have ever been frightened by thunder or lightning? It's like a bolt of lightning or a thunder just came so heavy and so sharp that although you are used to hearing thunder and you've seen lightning before, all of a sudden it comes in such a way in that moment that it jolted you. Wow, that was what the shout was when Joshua and all them Israelites shouted. It was like a bolt of lightning in the realm of the spirit. And it pierced everything that the kingdom of darkness had to offer. They saw the victory, taking control of the heaven. Wow, we have to take control of the heaven, please. Man, if God gives you something to shout about, you've got to shout. Some people don't, might not know what you're shouting about and want you to stop the noise, but man, if God gives you something to shout about, you lift up your voice and declare, God, you are great. You are El Gibor, miracle working God. We give you praise in the space. We ascribe greatness to you, our God the rock. You have to lift up your voice. It doesn't matter who is around and say, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless is holy name. You have to prophesy to yourselves sometimes. Lift up the heads which hang up. What have you been putting in the heavenlies? Joshua and Israel, they put a shot. What have you been putting in the heavenlies? Have you been putting something guided by the Holy Spirit that will bring some meaningful return? They locked up Paul and Silas in jail and they started out singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That part is just making melody in their heart. But at midnight, that thing intensified. Paul and Silas, Silas started, was 
putting something out there in the heavens. Woo. At midnight is when demonic activities are on the ramp. But Paul and Silas, they were putting something in the heavenlies guided by the Holy Spirit. And that place shook. There was an earthquake. I mean, it jolted every spirit of darkness that was, was around the place. The keeper of the jail almost got crazy. Paul, staying focused, said, sir, we're all here. Don't even worry about us running away. What you just saw was the power of God. But what caused that? They put something in the heavens. And what they put, that praise, that prayer was guided by the Holy Spirit. And it produced real supernatural results. Aren't you longing for some real supernatural results in your life? You can have it. What are you putting in the heavenlies? In Genesis, you know, the spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. Sin went out. I'm telling you that what you have to put in the heavenlies, it is more powerful than what the enemy has to put. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let me also say to you that wherever there is constant worship and righteousness, the tangible presence of the Lord tabernacles there. And this is why it is important to have a meeting place where you, you meet with God on a schedule. Because what happens when you do that often enough, guided by the Holy Spirit, because remember, he inhabits all praises. What happens is that it creates a hope and heaven in that space. If you go there constantly and pray every day, I mean Holy Ghost prayer and worship, it creates an open heaven in that space. And when I say open heaven, it's like a direct connection from where you are to the high heaven. It creates a hope and heaven. And this allows the execution of the kingdom of God on earth in that space. It is important to create that open heaven. So I'm saying, in, in our places of worship, there should be an open heaven there in where we meet on Sundays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Tuesdays. If we meet so often there, there should be an open heaven. So if there is no open heaven there, then could it be that we are just putting trivial things in the heaven? So when you go to pray or praise, you don't go telling God, God, I don't intend to go back over there or up there because those people are, are not with me. That's not what you put in the heaven. When you go and exalt the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you have highly exalted Jesus. And you have given him a name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. I thank you, Father God, that no other authority reigns in this space. But you go and exalt Jesus. Put the things of God in the heaven. Put the word of God in the heavens. Watch that open heaven takes place where execution of kingdom transaction can take place in that space. Wherever there is constant unbroken sin, on the flip side, demonic activities will control that space. If there is constant unbroken sin, no repentance, demonic activities will take over that space. I have seen on different occasions, many times, when people who often suffer from certain attacks, certain experiences, certain sicknesses. Interestingly, when they come where people or go where people who are constantly bombarding the heavenlies, when they go where those people are, all of a sudden they're okay. But when they leave the space, they're under attack again because the demons can not come and execute their activities in that space where there is the open air. I was in Botswana in Southern Africa. And there's a, there was a lady that they were witchcraft on her. 
And there was a flock of birds that followed that lady anywhere in Botswana she went. I'm talking about something that I saw. She went to the supermarket and then birds were on the supermarket, top of the supermarket, just waiting. Soon as she drove out, they're flying over the car. She get to the traffic light, they're on the traffic light. It was such a crazy pattern. The only two places that that lady was able to go that the birds could not go was the church and the pastor's house. I watched that lady moved into the pastor's house to get relief. She literally moved in. I'm talking about that space that an open heaven is created and the enemy cannot in any way intercept that space. We have to do all that we can to take control of the heavens so that we can become all that God wants us to be. I don't think that it is God's intention that we give up. I know it's not God's intention that we give up the heavenlies to the kingdom of darkness. In Numbers chapter 33, the Israelites were told, if you don't dispossess the inhabitants of the land, then they are going to be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side. If we don't take control of the heavenless, that's exactly what is going to happen. Them spirits that you allow will be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side. I want you to know this morning that the battle for the heavenless is constant and God is depending on us. God is depending on us to do our part, to take control of the heavenless. Oh, I, I'm not even really scratch the information on the heavenless. We barely got into it. But as I said, I know we don't have all the time to go through all of this. But let me just start, say a few things about the battlefield of the church. And then we close out and, and pick it up next time around. The battlefield of the church. The church is one of the three battlefields that exist in spiritual warfare. And sometimes it is not seen as a battlefield because people don't understand what is happening. But the battlefield of the church is about the enemy doing what he can to contaminate the church environment. So the devil will always try to divert focus from the direction of God and the leading of God. I have never, I have never been a part of a church. I don't know of a church group anywhere in the world that is genuinely serving God and mean to serve God that the enemy did not try to sow strife, division, and envy in that congregation. That's the battlefield of the church. He tries his best to sow envy among the believers. And sometimes when you don't realize what is happening and we act in the flesh, oh, we, people just have a party in the flesh and, and carry on with all kinds of stuff and don't realize that that is the enemy at work there. If he can get us to go to church with the intention of praising God, but leave in conflict, that, that's what he wants. So you now have to make up your mind. First, as an individual, I am not walking in any strife with anybody. And in order to do that, it means that sometimes you have to take the high road. Yeah, I know they said something about you, but look, I refuse to be drawn in any strife. And you can declare, spirit of strife, I see you. 
and I refuse to give you any space in this environment. We shut down your influence. There are so many congregations that are divided and that's exactly where the enemy wants. And we spend the whole year talking about who was right and who was wrong and who first did this almost like little children. Is him first lick me. And the enemy is having a field day sowing strife and division among the believers. Because if the unity of the spirit of God is not there, then you can't experience the manifestations of God. And people don't even know what they do. They decide to still come to church the next Sunday, but they come puffed up. What are you doing? It is about you taking responsibility for the environment of the church. You have to decide that, devil, you're not going to reign in this space. People are always going to come across the wrong way at church because of the nature of the spiritual warfare. It's a battlefield. So things are not going to always happen perfect at church. There are going to be issues, but you have to ensure at the end of the day that we don't leave divided. And I'm telling you that sometimes, in fact, let me say it this way. Now you can understand why Paul, writing in the epistle, he said, cast out those who cause divisions among you. Oh, yeah. That's a serious statement. Because you can try to keep one member at the expense of continuous strife in the church and nobody accomplished anything at the end of the day. Paul said, cast out those who cause division because cannot afford that kind of spirit in the church. Envy. Well, James says that where there is envying and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. Which congregation, which marriage, which family you know that the enemy did not try to sow strife. We have to recognize the spirit of strife and refuse to give it place in our lives. Because guess what? You see, if you don't, if that happens at church, in the church space, and you choose to declare that you were not wrong and you're not backing down and you get involved in that, guess what is going to happen? You are going to take that, it's a spirit, you know. So you're going to take that spirit of strife, whether you know it or not, from church, from that environment, to your home, to your house. So all of a sudden, that strife is not only at church, but it is also at your house. And you, you're wondering, where is God? If you see the spirit, shut it up. If the enemy can control the battlefield of the church, then man, he will uh, cause all kinds of trouble. Because all of a sudden, people are not going to be interested in coming to church anymore. And people think that, they're going to go there, but the enemy tries, tries it everywhere. But it is just that some people are able to control it better in terms of understanding that it's a spirit and you have to deal with it from that level. So after understanding those things, I've grown to a level where if you are looking for somebody to criticize, man, you can criticize me. It doesn't bother me. Taught. I, I'm way past that because I, I refuse to allow the devil to play those kind of tricks on me again. That spirit of strife should not reign in the church. And it is all of us responsibility. And when we have our prayer meetings, when we have our worship and all of that, this is why it should be guided by the Holy Spirit. Because even though you don't realize sometimes Man, when you release that kind of stuff in, in that space, it goes and diffuse, shut down those spirit of strife and envy in the church and cause you to come back and see a better environment and see God's word taking course. This is why unity is so important in the church. Paul talks about keeping the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Brothers and sisters, we can't rest. Every waking moment of our lives, we are in a fight. We're wrestling against principalities and powers. 
and the rulers of the darkness, we have to stay in the fight. I'm trusting the Lord today that you are ready to go forward, taking on the heaven, taking on the battlefield, the church, knowing that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. We thank you so much for joining us today. God bless you and have a great day. You may contact us by email at fcfmontegobay at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram at fcfmobay and on Facebook at fcfmontegobay.